Okay kids, so at some point, old JK announced that the Fantastic Beats and Where to Drop Them franchise was going to extend to five films. Alright, maybe she didn't technically announce it. Someone spilled the beans anyway. So, uh, this original idea was conceived before the crimes of Grindelwald, and let me tell you, the bloody crimes of Grindelwald, more like the crimes of the film was a cr crime. <laughs> The film was bad, alright? We all know the film was bad. I'm ignoring it, I'm ignoring it, I'm ignoring it, because in my second film, uh, we've got to plant some seeds, son, and as fun as it would be to try and rewrite Crimes of Grindelwald using the characters and the setting and the plot and everything, it's just too dull. It's just way too boring. So, we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna solve it. To preface my series, each of these installments is going to have the, um, moniker underneath of Tales from the Wizarding World. <laughs> I would like to note that I thought of this idea long before they started branding everything as Wizarding World and then they, since they re-released all the films with the stupid Wizarding World little icon and stuff like that. Look, I don't mind it, but uh, mine is going to be Tales from the Wizarding World <laughs> because it's meant to riff off a Star Wars story as in Rogue One a Star Wars story and Solo a Star Wars story. And, like the X-Men prequel films, like the first class uh, chronology of films, each of my films is going to jump about roughly 10 years in between. I will fill you in as we go along. Don't even worry about it. Okay, so just to recap, in Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them, we explored the American wizarding community in the 1920s. And it was a charming little film, a Christmas film. It avoided everything to do with prophecies and stupid MacGuffins and giant beamy things going into the sky, which was all the rage in 2016, don't you remember, kids? Which was the style at the time? So it was this refreshing, unlikely hero thrust into greatness story with just a hint, just a smidge, just a, just a light, uh, a light sprinkling of Grindelwald at the end. But wasn't it enough? Hells no. So, Fantastic Beasts 2, gotta catch them all. <coughs> Our second entry is that it's a globe-trotting adventure through the madcap world of the 1930s. Okay, Newt thought his creatures were all safely locked away in his case, but what's this? Someone has stolen the case and taken, uh, taken four of the creatures to four corners of the world. Better get the band back together, we're gonna visit London. Paris, maybe Rome for, for whatever reason, and at some point Newt needs a very important, very ancient book about magical beasts, which is held in the restricted section of the oldest library in the world. So, you know where that is. So young Dumbledore is introduced in this one, and yeah, sure, Jude Law complaint, whatever, it doesn't really matter. At once. Newt returns to Hogwarts, he grows very wary that these fantastic beasts have been captured for a bigger plan. So he goes off and does some clue hunting of his own. Maybe he visits some little pockets of the wizarding world we haven't seen because he's got underground connections, right? He knows some people, he's been some places, he's seen some stuff. I, I see that twinkle in his eye, that little twinkle, it's going to take us right to boom, exterior, Azkaban prison. It's a stormy scene. Grindelwald is locking something to the effect of, Ah, Mr. Scamander, I told you we'd meet again. But this is not a safe franchise, kids, and we want to establish that from the get-go. Game of Thrones style, well, early Game of Thrones style, Newt, his arm gets fucked. Like, he gets really injured. Like, maybe they use the beast against him, and because it's all bewitched, it doesn't recognize him as his master. His arm gets really, really injured. When Winterwall flies off just, just, as, just as Dumbledore appears, and Dumbledore, he loses it, right? He sees Grindelwald, he sees him escaping, he starts blasting, he starts full-on shooting sparks out of his wand, like a gun, right? Right? But it's magic bolt. Uh, but, but but his eyes are all teary because because love and romance and everything. Uh, you know, and this isn't like a violet Dumbledore by any stretch of the imagination. Just emotional and, and, and very angry. And that's kind of the climax of the story. So back at Hogwarts, Newt's adventures have, have taken a toll on him, and he he tucks himself away back into his suitcase for a little while. Um, and he, and Dumbledore promises him, don't even worry about it. The suitcase is going to be kept safe for as long as you need to recover. You know, so Dumbledore tucks Newt, in his, in his case, safely away in the Room of Requirement. He goes back to his office, and he's stroking Fox, or, or whatever, and he says, Well, you know, I don't think this is the last we've seen of our adventures. And he sits back, and he starts grading papers, and someone knocks on the door. And it's this little 11-year-old boy. And he's terrified, and he's 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 like teary-eyed, and he says, "Oh, I'm the you know," he says, "I'm lost. I, I don't know how to get back to the Slytherin house." And then Dumbledore says, "The stairs can be quite difficult." He jokes, he goes, "Oh, you have to ask them nicely. Come on now, I'll show you the way." What was your name again? The 
closing to our sequel is the boy's face as he says, Tom, sir. Tom Riddle. Okay, Call of Dumble, Wizarding World at War. Now it's 1944, and the Muggle world is plunged into World War II. The magical community is scrambling to try and fix everything. It is ripping at the seams. Some of them want to, some of the wizards want to go and fight and help and just end it all. The other ones want to stay out of it and, and respect the statute of secrecy. The opening scene is a magical flight over London during the Blitz between Grindelwald's men and Ministry Aurors. So the main setup for this film involves the president of Makusa, the Minister for Magic, and all other magical world leaders trying to decide what to do and how much influence they should have. They're getting ready to gather for, for essentially the Wizarding United Nations meeting, uh, which is the, the first of its kind. So obviously they're all aware that each other exists and they've had basic correspondence, but they've never had uh, any rhyme or reason to all meet and convene and discuss ideas until now. And they are totally blissfully unaware that they've been infiltrated because, you know, Wizarding Ministry is, is stupid and uh, as Harry Potter have taught us time and time again, don't trust the government. So while all this fighting is happening and while this transport situation is taking place, where's our boy Grindelwald? Oh, that cheeky chap, he's, he's fresh off stealing nothing other than the Elder Wand. So he returns to his own Grindel Nazis with a young Tom Riddle by his side. Now, your boy Tom doesn't have a massive part to play in this, but Grindelwald likes him. It's implied that Grindelwald also meets regularly with legitimate Nazi figureheads because he's that evil. So the opening battle runs its course and the survivors retreat back to the Grindel bunker. And amongst them is a character called Brian. He's not going to be called Brian, obviously, but I can't think of another name right now. So we're just going to call him by him. So he used to be a member of the Order of the Phoenix. He used to be one of Dumbledore's best men. He was part of the early iterations of the Order of the Phoenix. But back at Hogwarts, Dumbledore is under stress. He's being pressured to be, into becoming the Minister for Magic, but he's struggling with, with what happened to that boy Tom, and he's remembering, oh, I helped him with the stairs once and all this. And uh, Yeah, and so we uh, and we also see his relationship with Tom Riddle uh, sort of playing out in, fla in like mini flashbacks and what have you. Um, and he's stressed because, uh, you know, the Ministry wanted him to become the Minister for Magic and step up, and all the, the parents are pulling the kids out at Hogwarts due to the war and they're all uh, hiding them away in the countryside. The school is in shambles and a young Mad-Eye Moody is the Defense Against the Dark Arts professor and hilarity ensues. Also we'll chuck a young slope on in there because why the hell not. So Newt's story in this third installment is minimal. The, there's a lighter C plot because um, Brian actually, not only was he Dumbledore's friend, he used to be a teacher at Hogwarts. Uh, he used to be the Care for Medical Creatures teacher, right? You see where I'm going with this. But obviously he left, he's betrayed Dumbledore, he's gone to join Grindelwald's cause, and even though Care for Magical Creatures is like a laughably uh, inconsequential lesson, Dumbledore knocks on the case. He, he blows the dust off it, he goes down to Newt, who's all beardy and, and, and doesn't really understand people anymore because he's spent 10 years with, with, with his magical beasts and Dumbledore says to him I need a new teacher will you be my new care of magical creatures professor a little bit of retconning don't even worry about it Newt comes out of retirement to, to be a teacher for a bit and uh, he's all weirdy and awkward and he has a class and he's all nervous and the kids make fun of him until he takes him inside the case and then he instantly gains their respect because he's cool so, that's roughly the first half of the film. Grindelwald manages to infiltrate the Wizarding UN and strikes a surprise attack, and he kills a lot of nameless politicians, but he also kills the president of Makusa. Tina was standing in as vice president during this time, and she's all teary and upset about something else. Or maybe she finds out that Newt is technically back, but he's out of contact with her, so she's upset. Um, but the Wizarding FBI enters with a Bible, uh, to swear her in as the president of Makusa. It's a touching scene, really, but she ultimately struggles with the responsibility. So you've got her struggling with the pressure of being literal president of Makusa, and then Dumbledore struggling with being the headmaster of Hogwarts, and also everyone demanding that he becomes the prime minister. So, so on Grindelwald's side, he's brought Tom Riddle along, and he watches as well. Um, and there's like, at one point, there's a friendly fire blast, and that's how Tom Riddle gets his face all messed up. Um, so this is the story we have never seen. It's, it's poetic. It's romantic, it's furious, it's charged, it's aggressive, and it's heartbreaking. Ultimately, of course, Dumbledore wins, but at a price. Grindelwald puts himself in a position where by stopping him, Dumbledore must kill him. Dumbledore, of course, does I don't know how this is going to work out. Maybe he just does, like, an, a pretty easy way out is for him to, like, threaten someone else, like, someone innocent. I don't even know. Uh, Dumbledore obviously doesn't do this. But to disarm Grindelwald, to get him off his, his high ground, um, if you will, to get him off his high ground, he does have to severely hurt him and sort of not torture him, but just, just kind of hurt him enough so that he, he knocks him off his perch, essentially. Grindelwald's all 
injured and messed up and Dumbledore has to like hold his body and he's crying and it's very somber and sad. Uh, Tina steps down and elopes with the uh, with Newt and there's a tiny wedding inside the suitcase with all the major nice characters brought together. They're all battle worn, but they're happy. This is kind of the nice culmination of the first three films. It picks up directly all the themes from the first film, all the challenges we've put them through in the second film, and then delivers in this nice little scene. Dumbledore looks the worst. He looks awful and he's lamenting on the wedding he'll never have with Grindelwald. And maybe there's this really nice moment where he's sort of standing on the best man side of Newt's side and looks over and then he sees like he thinks he sees Grindelwald maybe the mirror of Erised is just sort of put there for reasons unknown to us and uh, and they kind of mime the the actions together do you know what I mean if they're like telepathically linked or whatever and they sort of go through the motions as if it was their ceremony as if they were saying the vows to each other so after this we cut to Grindelwald's special brand of Nazis or uh, Grindel Nazis uh, and they're basically diminished but there's a small band of loyal followers who are, who are in hiding. The figure approaches them with a plan. They'll regroup and try again. It'll take a long time but they'll get there. They can pick up the work that Grindelwald started. Uh, the magical creatures professor Brian he recognises the boy from school. Tom Riddle. Tom <laughs> Bloody hell are we still doing these? This is the least developed uh, that I've got out of the lot, but it's basically the Marauders at school. And it spans the 1960s and what they get up to. I know a lot of people want it to be a BBC series or a Netflix series, and then over there. Right. Look, that does a bit fine and lovely, but it doesn't really need to be. Uh, we, we can do it all in one film. It's, it's all about what they get up to. So, um, the, the series now sort of plays into Dumbledore to bridge the gap between an aging Jude Law and then a young Richard Harris slash Michael Gambon. This is the film where he's starting to show his age a bit, you know what I mean? It's it's, it's in the 60s now, you know what I mean? He's been in this game since the 20s, or, or the very least the 30s. He's starting to show his age. We're exploring his relationship with his family, uh, with his sister, and everything like that. Just sort of the... the, 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 the I, know, I know so far a lot of Dumbledore stories, him existing in flashbacks of other characters, and how his actions have been in retrospect to those other characters. That's fine, but I don't worry about it. Our new heroes are going to break down like this. You'll have James and Lily. We've got this love-hate relationship at first, but they become best buddies, and indeed, lovers. You've got Ramus, the nerdy one. You've got Sirius, the rebel without a cause. And you've got Peter, the other nerdy one. Uh, Bellatrix will be batshit crazy um, in this one. We're really going to explore that um, that relationship with the Black family. Lucius Malfoy is a snob. Uh, Molly and Arthur Weasley, they're the comic relief couple. Rebel Wilson, James Corden sort of thing. Uh, Goldwyn Lockhart is also here. He's going to provide a little bit of comic relief. Alongside these, we'll, we'll get little cameos from uh, an older Mad-Eye Moody, Hagrid's going to be there, Professor Trelawney, McGonagall, the Longbottoms, Kings of Shacklebolt, they're all doing their thing. Voldemort is out making Horcruxes, right? And in their final year, they make a ragtag makeshift Order of the Phoenix to go and fight him. Um, even though they're going against Dumbledore's direct order specifically not to do this. He's specifically, he's, he's got a big hall assembly, and you know, it's all like 1960s and stuff, and, he, and he's saying to him, guys, he's like, I know, I appreciate he's challenging and uncertain times, but I forbid any student to go out and fight in this war. If you do, you'll be expelled from Hogwarts. I'm not going to let you back in Hogwarts. Will always be help will always be found for those who need it, but unfortunately not those who go out and fight Voldemort against my orders sort of thing. Because the Dumbledore is going to be out and about, a new headmaster is going to take place. They're a pretty inconsequential character, but they're pretty stupid and they they sort of enforce a lot of things. It's not an umbrage situation. It is not an umbrage situation, but it's just a case. Of, they're more like a Barty Crouch, to be honest with you. They're a ministry employee. They've been put in charge. Obviously, from their perspective, they've been put in charge of looking after the, the school. They're taking the post. So they're, they're, they're housekeeping for the guy that's tipped for being minister for magic, so they see themselves as being much better at the job but they're very bureaucratic and very sort of boring and stuff and very much hammering over the um the, the uh, assessments and the, the exams and what have you. Um, but there's this like end of year, um, you know, end of their final year scene where the guys all sneak out um, uh, and, and they do their uh, transfiguration stuff to become an uh, anime guy. It's a lot of fun. Um, there's, a, there's a big battle, maybe it's in the Ministry for Magic, maybe it's out in the hills, I don't know. I'd like to take it out of the city because I don't feel, I feel like the city plots are for grown-ups, like we've literally done one that included like the whole Wizarding World United Nations, so maybe this one can take place in like Godric's Hollow or something like that. Uh, but the ending is going to be somber. The gang will get ready for what's to come, very much borrowing from the beats of Half-Blood Prince. Bellatrix and Lucius will slip away to do bad things and Dumbledore, he just wants a 
nap. He just wants a rest, mate. Oh, uh, someone grab her a towel. It's Fantastic Beast 5. Please, God, make it stop. Uh, this is the Wizarding War of the 70s. The community is in shatters, uh, once again, and infiltrated by spies on both sides and all sorts. It's espionage, son. Also, uh, in this one, we're going to include giants and dragons because uh, the baddies used them, right? And also, it is technically Fantastic Beasts, so they're beasts, right? The Order of the Phoenix is actually formed in this one. We've seen echoes of it. We've been tittering over to this revolution, and now it's hip-hop happening. There's a big fight at the end, as is standard with all these films, apparently. Again, could be in the city, could be not. Could be at Hogwarts, could be not. I think if it was at Hogwarts, we would have heard about it by now, but then, you know, in the canon films, but you know, who cares about canon at this point? Uh, so, you know, big fight, uh, one score, bang, bang. But Dumbledore knows he can't face this alone, so he brings back, Avengers style, the original cast. So he gets an aging Newt and Tina, who obviously by this point is literally 50 years after the first film, so they're like old as balls, right? But they, they know their stuff, they know a few tricks up their sleeves. But the, the other one, ultimate epilogue to this whole series is a wedding at, um, at the Burrow, the Weasley's first house. They're expecting their first child, and Molly jokes, no, nah, just the one, Arthur, but he's got a little twin to, uh, twinkle in his eye. He knows, uh, Dumbledore knows that twinkle as well. Uh, he knows, it's like, ah, just the one, you'll be lucky if we get seven. Um, you know, we want to finish on a, uh, we want to finish on a happy note, right? As you can see throughout the series, uh, uh, Dumbledore has a pretty fairly ongoing presence. He's kind of the Nick Fury tying it all together. Newt uh, Scamander starts to have a less of a presence, which is not a bad thing, because bear in mind, he's literally just the name of a textbook character, as if um, as if, as if they made a prequel series based off the librarian in Attack of the Clones, for example. If an item does not appear in our records, it does not exist. Uh, do you know what I mean? It's just like some random sort of author of the that they sort of picks because by the end you know Voldemort will be seeking him out for counsel and so don't worry about it